our next speaker, who you've already sort of met, um, Sarah Pratt, <laughs> is currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Enforcement uh, and Programs at the Office of, of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity um, in DC. I've actually had the honor and the pleasure uh, to know her for many, many years. Uh, she's kind of the go-to person for fair housing advocates across the country, uh, not only to ask about you know, just all manner of fair housing issues, including federal law as well as, uh, as uh, uh, administrative procedures at HUD, and she's put a tremendous amount of work uh, into the regulation of affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, which is always such a mouthful, but she's something that she's going to be talking about. Um, and we've been hoping that would, this would come out of HUD for, for many years, and it looks like we're on the verge of getting a final rule. Um, she is a force to be reckoned with uh, in the field of fair housing, and she is one of the most dedicated people that I know. I actually was really thrilled to learn that she was going to be coming here to join us today because I knew that having her here would set the right tone uh, and make our conference a big success. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Pratt. Thank you. Thank goodness she didn't say that I'd been working in fair housing for 39 years, <laughs> which is true, but don't tell anybody. Started when I was six. I'm very happy to be, be here today. I've um, been reading, uh, talking to my staff, and interacting with people around the country about uh, issues in Marin County for a number of years, although um, I was not at HUD during the time when uh, various actions uh, were started and discussions began about addressing concerns uh, in Marin. Um, I look at things from a helicopter view of Washington. I see the congressional side of things, I see the policy side of things, and I see the enforcement side of things. And um, I'm going to try to give you an, a not too long a time frame, sort of um, a push and a helping hand and a challenge about the issues that you confront in this general area, in the Bay Area, that relate to the obligation to affirmatively further fair housing and addressing patterns of segregation, concentrations of poverty, and um, the lack of housing opportunities for a whole cast of groups that are not well served by the way our communities and our housing delivery is structured today. So Dr. King, you can hardly give a speech about fair housing without talking about Dr. King. One of the most exciting parts of my life is that, as many of you know, you've seen the movie Selma recently, many of you, I imagine. The 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama is coming up in March. And one of the greatest moments of pride for me is that I've received an invitation to speak uh, in Selma as part of those activities. The showing of the movie Selma has really brought up, combined with other events in places like Ferguson and New York and, and other places as well, has really drawn our attention again to the gap uh, on, between our societies and to the disconnects that we still see in our world. Things that maybe we thought were long gone or past are not really past. They are, are present. And unless we act and act strongly and responsibly, they will continue to be our future. Dr. King said as part of his 1968 uh, I Have a Dream speech, he talked about, he said this, we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. And he went on and he said, we refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity in our nation. And that kind of ringing call to say, you know, justice is not over. Opportunity must be provided. Opportunity in a country as great as ours is something that we should aspire to, that we should cre create and recreate and change over time to make sure that everyone in our communities have an opportunity themselves to have access to opportunity. I mean, in 1968, he said that. I mean, just what, seven days later, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act, seven days after the assassination of Dr. King, Congress passed the Fair Housing Act that has this provision in it that says, by the way, not just that HUD funded entities, but all programs related to housing and urban development must affirmatively further fair housing. And so what does that say to us about the creation or recreation of opportunity in our communities? 
Well, it says, it says a number of really important things. And I really, I'm a lawyer, but I, honestly, I'm not here to talk to you about the legal stuff. I'm talk to, talking to you about a combination of harms created by segregation and um, disinvestment in communities of color. I'm here to talk to you about the planning approach to uh, changing communities and a locally based grassroots effort that I'm going to call on you to participate in to make changes in your communities. So we have this obligation at HUD as federal folks to sort of make sure that the activities of entities that we fund affirmatively further fair housing, that's a great catchword, but what the heck does it mean? Because we've still been struggling with it since 1968 and I'm still giving the speech, right? So the, the question about that is what does that list look like today and, um, and, and what is it that it, we are called to do about it? So that means public housing agencies and cities and states are responsible in their own programs for affirmatively furthering fair housing, but it also means that they need to be aware of what's going on in their communities, even by private actors, so that they can address as well the activities that might be going on privately, whether it's by, you know, a cross burner, and maybe you don't have those in Moran. In Chevy Chase, Maryland, within the last three weeks, a Chevy Chase, Maryland's kind of an upscale, upscale middle-class neighborhood and crosses between D.C. and Maryland. African-American family bought a house, painted on their garage within a week after they moved in is, was, inward, go home. So for anyone who thought that old patterns of race-based hatred were gone, let me just say, they are not. So we have, and that's a private action, a criminal, in fact, a criminal action is vandalism, and it's also a hate crime, right? So communities who read about these things in the paper, or who know about them because everybody's talking about them at the water cooler or at Starbucks, have an obligation to address those issues as well. So when we think about the obligation to affirmatively further fair housing, we've got three parts to the equation. One is real-time discrimination today. Real-time discrimination today. And I, really, I'm not talking about the one-on-one -on -one individual cases that you hear about. I'm talking about, you know, structural issues that are still going on today, whether it is a decision about where affordable housing will be cited, an effort to say, no, 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 no. We, um, we don't want families like that in our community, but we'll take some seniors, right? Yeah, people say amen. If I can't say amen, say ouch. Um, so you've got, you've got real-time discrimination uh, today, but you've also got long-standing institutional barriers that are part of the equation that nobody is thinking twice about in so many communities, and yet, and yet we must. So Ken mentioned in his Fair Housing 101 session a little bit earlier this pr process in the 1930s where a federal government entity, the precursor of today's FHA, went out there and looked at communities and I've actually seen the maps. They're colored with red pencil, those neighborhoods that are occupied by African Americans where no loans could be made, right? It's truly the origin, origin of the phrase redlining, red pencils. They're, these maps are, in many cases, online. So I looked at Richmond, Virginia. So you got the red areas where no loans could be made in 1930s, and then you compare them to the patterns of racial segregation today, and guess what? They are identical. They are exactly the same neighborhoods, perhaps a little bit larger today than in the past. That's a historical leg legacy of a government policy or practice that has not yet been undone, has not yet been resolved, has not been really even in many communities thought about because it's so much a part of the day-to-day -day operations of that community. And yet when you focus on it, you become aware of that pattern. And so we have real-time actions of discrimination, public or private, in today's world. We have the long-standing legacy of discrimination that has not yet been undone, some people would call it institutionalized racism or structural racism. In some cases, structural racism part of it is truly structural because it has to do with housing where housing has been put. So it's physical. And in some cases, it's attitudinal. 
barriers, assumptions, and understandings often shared in common by some parts of the community, even occasionally shared by the entire community. And then finally, the idea that we have to address both um, state and local activity and private actions in our obligation, as we address our obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. So, here, let me give you some examples of the historical legacy that we're dealing with. Racial segregation or segregation by national origin, by neighborhood or by site, okay? If you live in almost any community, whether it's Marin County or San Francisco, the Bay Area or uh, Riverside County, you name it, you can, if I say to you, name me some neighborhoods that you would describe as being segregated by race, you could do it, couldn't you? Identifiable by race, identifiable by my national origin, you could do it, couldn't you? Some, some situations it's a relatively small aspect, in some situations it's a larger aspect of that community. Segregation by sight, anybody know anything about a, what's that guy's name, Donald Sterling? Ran, ran, in addition to all the other things that he's extremely well known for, <clears throat> which I won't comment on, you know, he was sued some years ago by the Department of Justice for setting aside housing only for people who are Korean. Right? He wouldn't let blacks in. Wouldn't let, it was for Koreans, Koreatown. He was sued successfully by the Department of Justice. We still have some legacy properties like that around here in, across our, our, the Bay Area as well. Only for this ethnic group, only for this group, or the properties that in some parts of the community are completely occupied by, by uh, people of color, and in other parts of the community operated sometimes by the same developer that are mostly white. Still exist. We have still in place, um, and the history books char chart this. We, in this country, we had racially restrictive covenants for many years that attached to the single family neighborhoods. So many single-family neighborhoods started out as white neighborhoods under the res racially restrictive policies of the 30s, and racially restrictive covenants continued that existence. I, I don't know any, if any of you are um, real estate agents. A dear friend of mine, Fred Underwood, works for the National Association of Realtors. He was buying a house in um, Alexandria, Virginia, and discovered to his horror that there was a racially restrictive covenant still attached to the land that said he couldn't sell his house. Uh, to, um, didn't say African Americans, I think it said uh, to Africans or something like that. Those uh, racially restrictive covenants and religiously restrictive covenants still do exist. They're not enforceable, of course, and they haven't been enforceable since 1948, but they still are out there as a sign and a signal to folks, don't, you're not welcome here. Sundown Towns, the history of Sundown Towns. A guy named James Lowen did an amazing study and a ton of research about Sundown Towns. Sundown Towns are towns in which people of color are welcome during the day to work or shop, but they, are, they go and live somewhere else. At, they go home at night, and they're not allowed to be in that town after sundown. Those towns developed historically starting about 1910, 1915 across our country. Mr. Lowen has a book called Sundown Towns and a website where you can go take a look. And lest you think, you are from the left coast, that this is all about the south, right? It's not about the south because there is some evidence that Pasadena, California was a sundown town at one point. Anybody hear that? Okay. Other places as well. Take a look at his map, you'll find it interesting. Uh, we have the his historical phenomenon of white flight, where communities uh, were in racial transition, and in some communities that um, racial transition was exploited by the real estate industry to encourage whites to leave town, and then uh, and to leave our center cities essentially to poor blacks, and then poor Latinos, and then poor Asians. Now, one of the more interesting things about life that I live is I now see the reverse happening. You seen this in your communities? So, let's see, San Francisco, losing affordable housing left and right, where are the people of color ending up? Yeah, see, you know, if you, if you put it out there and think about it, you know what those patterns look like. I live in D.C. D.C. has become less segregated in the last, uh, you know, between the two, two most recent censuses, less segregated, and the communities that I spend time is less segregated, and you say, oh, that's great, right? Except not so much. Because where are the people of color going? Where are they living? Where are they going to find housing that they can afford 
right? And so that says a message to us that reducing segregation is not the beginning, the end of the story. I mean, if your answer to reducing segregation is give everybody a voucher and invite them to move to the next county, that is not a satisfactory answer to segregation because structural segregation requires a structural answer, a structural answer. Um, a lot of uh, communities, uh, housing authority areas, uh, areas occupied by African Americans over the years were, <coughs> excuse me, carved out, isolated, even made into being like an island by urban redevelopment and or highway development. So I don't know how many towns I've gone to to see the um, public housing units or the poor side of town or the minority part of the community on, in a little triangle in which downtown is here, interstate is here, river is here. There's no way for that community to grow and it's not a huge incentive for redevelopment of that community because it's a relatively narrow space. And so we've created islands of segregation and poverty by the way we've created the structures around them. And that's of course not even mentioning that many of these houses were in the first place put next to concrete plants, uh, industrial uh, sites, environmentally challenged uh, areas and the like. Uh, I won't mention the community because it hasn't hit the news yet, but uh, HUD just, rev just reviewed and refused uh, permission to a housing authority, my office did, refused permission to a housing authority to rebuild um, new units in a historically segregated area. It was a mostly black neighborhood. And there is some interest in rebuilding and reinvesting in those communities, and there are programs out there that allow this to happen. But in this case, there was a little problem. They wanted to rebuild the same 100 units that had been segregated 100% black since at least 1982. They wanted to rebuild units right there. There is nothing else there. Oh, well, yeah, there is something else there. There are railroad tracks within 400 feet of the site. There's a asphalt plant. There's a concrete plant. Um, there's nothing. There's not a grocery store. There's not a bank or a branch or an ATM. There's not a CVS or a drugstore. There's not a Panera Starbucks or nothing. <laughs> right? There's nothing there. And so the idea was let's just carve out this little community, and let's just continue to put the housing there. Nicer form of housing, higher class level of segregation, and nothing that causes, that represents investment in the community. Historic other patterns, long-standing patterns of zoning. Someone, I said to someone last night, oh, you know, those, those old style zoning rules, you know, the ones that say, no, no multifamily or no public housing or no affordable housing. People say, well, we have ordinances like that right here in California still on the books. HUD's taken on Westchester County, New York over issues of uh, zoning, exclusionary zoning. Westchester County maybe followed this a little bit. I'm not going to talk about it extensively because if you haven't heard about it, I can't explain it in 30 seconds. I can just say Westchester County is very white, very rich, and it has pockets of racial segregation and poverty. And it has a lot of, it's a big county, so it's a very large uh, county, but it has a lot of smaller communities that have zoning that have requirements like this. Uh, the minimum lot size is 10,000 square feet. There's no zoning. Now, minimum lot size for 10,000 square feet and high cost Westchester County means that there will be a mansion built on it, period, end of story. There is zoning that specifically limits affordable, um, not affordable housing, multifamily housing to no more than two units. So if you're going to be a developer and trying to develop some affordable housing, there's no profit in developing two units, y'all, right? And, um, and so the, the instructions to Westchester County was go look at the zoning requirements in all these little communities that are setting up barriers to the development of affordable housing because if you remove those barriers, developers will go there and devo develop more affordable housing and you will start undoing these patterns of segregation, long-standing patterns of segregation across Westchester County and we're fighting them. And we've, th we've taken them to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals twice because they don't want to do that. Why do they not want to do that? That's a question I pose to you. <laughs> the same reason Marin doesn't is what the gentleman in the audience says. So yeah, there's so yes, there's there is a always a long standing resistance, not usually today racial in tone, 
but it's exactly the kind of resistance we saw 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. They just maybe are a little more polite about it, and they phrase it in terms of the federal government get out of my face, as opposed to we don't want blacks in our neighborhood, but the effect works out to be exactly the same. If government mandated segregation of public housing across the country, that was the law of our country. Uh, it was only undone um, uh, really by law uh, in the 60s, and it was not undone by practice for many, many, many years thereafter, and in some places it still exists. So I, sp I spent the 1980s desegregating public housing in Kentucky because they hadn't done it on their own. They still had black sites and white sites. Currently, we at HUD have uh, issued a letter of finding under Title VI against a housing authority in Cairo. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say the location. Cairo, itch, Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> For complete segregation of public housing and skip overs on the list to accommodate blacks going to one site and whites going to another site. And the Department of Justice is suing a housing authority in Ruston, Louisiana over the same thing. And the perpetuation of segregation because every time you go it into a zoning, whatever it is, or a discussion about where we're going to put affordable housing, everybody suggests the same old neighborhood. Where all the affordable housing is, where all the landlords are that accept Section 8, where all the public housing is, suggest those neighborhoods for your next affordable housing site. So these long-standing patterns and attitudes have created the perpetuation of segregation across our country. Just no question about it. I'm talking mostly about race and national origin, but I will tell you that the same issues apply to people with disabilities. So segregation of people with disabilities, how would you like to spend your first year of married life with living with a person with a disability in senior housing? You're 22, your husband's 24, and the only place you can find accessible housing is in senior housing. Did you want to spend your first year of married life having old people looking over your shoulder every time you go anywhere? <laughs> Just checking. Right? You know, um, and senior housing is like the favored child. You can, a lot of times, people, you can get approval for senior housing. Uh, harder to find uh, housing for non-elderly disabled people. Uh, you still see segregation in some, in some instances of non, uh, of, um, non-elderly disabled people, you see exclusion of them in a 202 or an 811. Uh, you see, then you see the Department of Justice bringing lawsuits under the rubric of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, to desegregate and to provide resident community-based opportunities for people with disabilities to live. The same issues that we've seen with race and national origin are now becoming much more applicable to people with disabilities. So it turns out that these old patterns of um, segregation and exclusion and denial of opportunity are still affecting us today over and over again. There are still um, insurmountable barriers to opportunity. So here are the kinds of things we discuss. And I'm going to start in a place you might not expect. I'm going to start in talking about investment in communities of color and poverty. Those communities that have been left behind too often. There's no there there. There is no health care. The schools are terrible or dreadful. They have no access to transportation. They have no um, access to, to, um, to jobs in many cases. If you look at the commuting patterns, the co they're, they're not connected to the commuting patterns. And if they don't have a car, they're left to public transportation that comes nowhere near them. There's no drugstore, no grocery store. In many cases, uh, areas of racial segregation and national or origin segregation are completely equivalent to food deserts. You know, everybody know where food deserts are? Places where you can't find, you know, fresh food and good quality food within so many miles. Many areas of segregation that are uh, marked by segregation and, and poverty have, are also food deserts. So where's the grocery store? Where's the drug store? Uh, where's the branch bank? Where's the place to get your loan? Where's the ATM? Right? So the lack of investment in those communities um, say to us, don't abandon those communities. And, and this is, we fight this in, in many places. It's like the community says, oh, these neighborhoods, we've just woken up. These neighborhoods are so dreadful for our people. So we're going to get rid of them. We're just going to bring in the bulldozers, and tear, tear down the neighborhood, give everybody a voucher and wave bye-bye and hope they leave town. 
Because I tell you, I'm, I fought that in Galveston, Texas. I, I, you know, it's, it came up in Joliet, Illinois. Both of those cases was us heavily involved with. Because that is not an adequate solution for people of color. It destroys their neighborhoods. It discovers their, destroys their housing. It destroys the linked networks that they have created for themselves. And it harms them again after years of living in segregation without anything there. It says, okay, goodbye. Go find your own place. And at a time where many landlords do not accept Section 8 vouchers, except those located that are already located in segregated areas, it does not offer access to opportunity in min any meaningful way. So what else? So we talk about investment of communities of color. And we say to people, and this is ironic in an interesting way, many of those areas that were segregated and designed to be in not such cool neighborhoods and put there in the long ago times, now... Their locations have become cool. They have become cool. And, you know, they're, clo they're closer to downtown. They're, the, you know, it's Candlestick Park or wherever the heck it is, right? And, you know, and, and so people say, well, let's just, let's just take all the public housing out of there, relocate it somewhere else far, far away, and let's put in high-end gentrification, gentrified housing, replacing housing. My view of this is gentrification is not inherently bad. But what you have to do is you have to build up some affordable housing. Some gets displaced and re relocated, preferably with hard units somewhere else. And you bring in some higher end housing. Where's Tim Iglesias? He's going to talk about this later. Uh, let's talk about uh, you know, having inclusionary zoning ordinances so that new market rate housing has some affordable units in it, right? In that neighborhood. And then, the, you know what happens, this happens, I've seen it happening in the neighborhood where I go to church. You know, they bring in some, which is a poor African-American neighborhood in D.C., close to downtown. And then today, it was like, you know, nobody wanted to live there. And they tore down some warehouses and built co-ops and um, sub had subsidized housing. Now, it's so attractive because downtown has grown and it's now on the edge of downtown burgeoning. They want to tear everything down and build high-end rentals and condos you know, for the young yuppies that are now returning to the downtown area in the reverse white flight pattern. And so to, to have that neighborhood be strong, you want some market rate stuff, and you preferably have a, a grocery store or a drug store or a bank that comes in with it, but you also s to sustain and support affordable housing in that community. So the ultimate, where you ultimately end up with is a neighborhood that is economically diverse, has a diversity of uses available, including services and amenities for everybody, and that is, in, in effect, does not destroy the community of color trying to get there that's been there for 30, 40, 50 years. This can be done. It can be done, it can be done if you work on communities and neighborhoods on a neighbor-by-neighborhood neighborhood basis. At the same time, we think about what are the barriers to citing affordable housing in other places where there is already opportunity, just no affordable housing. Where, what are those areas? Well, you know, they're the places that when you live in a town, you say, gee, I wish I could live out there. Right? They got good schools. They got the Starbucks, the Panera. <laughs> right? They have the Walmart, maybe, or the Target. Right? Right? It's got the good schools. Maybe they've just built the, new, the great new high school out there. Right? And most people who are moving out to those areas, and I've seen it over and over again, I've spoken a million places, people can, when I say, where would you like to live? They always say exactly what I said as a single mom of a teenager. Well, I, I want to play, have a, live in a place where there's good schools. I want my kid to be able to walk home from school or ride a bus right? So I'm not running carpool. I want to be within walking distance of a grocery store or a drug store so she can get her stuff so that I don't have to run and get that. It'd be nice if it was near a bus line so she can go to an a get an after-school job when she's ready to do that. I want it to be safe, right? I'd like to have a hospital somewhere nearby when, it, when she busts her ankle turning somersaults on the living room floor, right? That's what I we Parents, what do you want for your kids? You want that. So those are opportunity areas, and you think about them, and you can think about exactly where they are, where you live. That is also where some affordable housing should be. And if there is not a bus, it's got everything else but not a bus, then you figure out how to provide public transportation, 
or a light rail or whatever. I'll tell you that um, and, and, and I'm going off my notes. Uh, maybe I really wasn't ever on them. Uh, <laughs> Don't, talk, don't tell on me, you HUD people. Don't report me back to the big bosses in D.C. But, I mean, these are things we talk about at HUD all the time. This is this approach of being very intentional, very intentional about what we, what we do in our communities and paying attention to the patterns of segregation by race, the patterns of segregation by national origin, the patterns of poverty, right, and looking at where is opportunity, and where is not opportunity? And opportunity, you know, everybody has a different definition. But it's, for me, it's the stuff I wanted to have as a single mom of a teenager. What a stuff I just said. And I suspect for most of us, we got some list that's sort of like that. So in the work that we do, the work that we do at HUD for enforcement purposes, I just want to give you a flavor of some of the things, some of the fights we're fighting, some of the things we're doing before we get back to the planning stage and taking on your local community, because you thought I'd forgotten that, that I was going to like make you do some work when you left here. I have not forgotten. But let me tell you some of the stuff we're doing right now. So we took on residency preferences in the Section 8 program in Dubuque, Iowa. Now, residency preferences are preference for housing or for affordable housing or housing funded locally or by, by HUD. Residency preferences aren't in themselves illegal. You can do them. You can give some preference for local residents. However, they have to be examined to whether or not they exclude uh, people based on race. So if you've got an all-white enclave, um, say Monroe County, Pennsylvania, just to pick a hypothetical example, and it's... <laughs> Don't tell my people back, back, back home I'm doing this. And it's within easy commuting distance of New York City. And, it, and there's new affordable housing. And the waiting list in New York City for affordable housing is 18,000 years long. So people who get, you know, get vouchers or want affordable housing with, even without a voucher would like to find such a housing without waiting for 18,000 years. And so they look around and they go, Monroe County, Pennsylvania is only a 60-mile commute. We can carpool with so-and-so and such-and-such. -and -such, or we can take the bus. So let's go out there and look. Monroe County, Pennsylvania finds out that that's happening because a few folks from New York City start moving into their place, so they immediately adopt a residency preference that gives 100% preference to people who live in Monroe County, Pennsylvania. And if I mention that Monroe County, Pennsylvania is 86% white, what does the residency preference do? You might just as well put a wall up at the, end, at the outside of town that says sundown town. Might just as well. All right? So no, that doesn't work. In some places, residency preferences are okay. In some places, it's because the community is already diverse and you're giving preference to your local folks and you can indulge yourself. But in some places, especially where residency preferences are applied to uh, communities that are mostly white, um, they serve as barriers, uh, almost insurmountable barriers to moving into the community of people of color. So in Dubuque, the Section 8 program first stopped using all of its vouchers. Have you ever heard of this? In a time when we need so much affordable housing, they were turning back in their vouchers. And then they set a local residency preference of, I can't remember. It was, you got a preference if you lived in Dubuque and an additional preference if you lived in Iowa. Dubuque was 87% white. I don't remember the numbers for Iowa, but it's pretty white too. And voucher holders from Chicago who were desperately seeking a safe place with good schools to raise their kids could not get anywhere on the list in Dubuque because the local preferences gave so much priority to local folks that they didn't have a choice. We issued a letter of finding. We settled that case. Um, we threatened. We told. No, wait. We didn't threaten anybody. Yeah, it doesn't do that. We told, we told Dubuque that we felt, we believed that the way they were operating their Section 8 program failed to affirmatively further fair housing and violated Title VI, and we would love it if they could fix it quickly, or we were unfortunately going to have to look at the way that they received their funding from HUD. And, and it worked. They resolved it. And you know what? They're happy. They, the, the, the day after the letter got to them, the um, mayor went in the news and said, we, we had no idea we were doing this. We're so sorry. <laughs> so maybe he didn't. I mean, really. You know, that's the other thing. Some people have blinders on about these things. So it's not about malicious intent or these people are all racist or anything. 
It's like not opening your eyes, not looking fully, not thinking things through, not thinking about the consequences of your actions. My mom always said, you got to think about the consequences of your action. Okay. So we had, um, we've had, uh, we've also taken on similar residency preferences in the states of Connecticut and Massachusetts, and I've heard about residency preferences in use in Marin County. I don't know if they exist now or not. Uh, we've taken on uh, decisions by local communities not to approve affordable housing, in particular white, whiter communities, um, or trying to change the character of the housing so no more family housing, we just want seniors instead in places like Sussex County, Delaware, Galveston, Texas, Houston, Texas. Some of you may have read about the challenges that we've gone through with St. Bernard Parish. St. Bernard Parish is right adjacent to the Lower Ninth Ward, which flooded so badly in Katrina. It was rip widely reported in the media that St. Bernard Parish put along guards, but, uh, uh, which is St. Bernard Parish is it was 93, 94% white at the time um, that of Katrina. And it was widely reported in the news that guards uh, were put up by, by St. Bernard Parish on the line between the parish and the Lower Ninth Ward to keep the residents of the Lower Ninth Ward, which were but basically African-American people from coming into St. Bernard Parish as they were trying to escape the flood. So you had a, all, basically an all-white parish right adjacent to an all-black parish. Uh, St. Bernard Parish, when during rebuilding time, set a rule that said uh, for you to come back and live in St. Bernard Parish, remember, 93% white, you had to be related by blood or marriage to someone who lived there before the storm. So what's the effect of that? Oh yeah, Judge Ginger Berrigan found that that, vi that um, decision violated the Fair Housing Act without too much trouble. Because everybody in the room knows it when you hear it. You know it. It doesn't require statistical evidence or proof. You know it when you hear it, don't you? Then they, uh, St. Bernard adopted a very complicated and expensive zoning process, or a perm permitting process for, if you wanted to rent out your single family home, you know, you couldn't live there because your job was uh, destroyed in the storm, so you are living with your family somewhere else, but maybe you could rent out your house. Um, they, St. Bernard Parish apparently was afraid that blacks would rent the individual houses and or the Section 8 program would send voucher holders out there to take over St. Bernard Her County. So you had to come back for, a, a, you had to pay a lot of money and you had to come back for a hearing in which parish council members would rake you over the coals if they thought you were going to rent to a poor person or to a black person or to a Section 8 voucher holder. And, um, and then... So all of this conversation was, in fact, replete with race. And then um, they turn, they, the ordinance limited how many of such houses you could have in a given block. So they put in a spatial requirement to limit the number of rentals for uh, affordable single family in St. Bernard Parish. And when that got struck down by my friend, Jen, not my friend, but really a stunningly good federal judge in a very carefully worded opinion, finding intentional discrimination. Uh, they then tried to downzone the community and reduce the amount of, pro of, the, of land mass that was zoned for multifamily so that it would be pretty much, they wanted to preserve their single family residence and keep out apartments and affordable housing apartments. And then they took on uh, the developer of affordable housing, uh, Provident Developers, a company for whom I will just tell you I have enormous respect. So they're trying to build four properties in St. Bernard Parish with tax credits. And they had so many struggles, I can't even tell you. They had, the, 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 the parish cut off their water, they cut off their electricity, they made them, they withdrew their permits, which had already been approved, and then they withdrew them. And the sites were great. They were building a new hospital in St. Bernard, or they wanted to, and the sites for the uh, tax credit housing was going to be in St. Bernard. It would be very much affordable, huge numbers of people needing affordable housing, and it was going to be very close to the hospital, which was going to open up, and there were going to be jobs. And so, in general, that was a great opportunity. It took um, former Secretary of HUD, Sean Donovan, calling the parish officials into a meeting in his office in Washington, a meeting which I was lucky enough to attend, to tell them that they needed to rescind these discriminatory ordinances or unfortunately HUD was going to have a hard time finding funding for the hospital that they wanted to build. And the parish went back and rescinded the two discriminatory ordinances. There have been multiple lawsuits against the parish by a variety of people, including the Department of Justice as well. Just a couple of other things to think about when you're thinking about building community. Language barriers. 
Uh, Ken went through the LEP requirements, the language, the limited English proficiency barriers. But I can tell you, if you have something to do with the shelter, if you have to, something to do with domestic violence, if you have something to do with public or assisted housing, if you have something to do with serving underserved people in Marin, in the Bay Area, language, language interpretation, availability of documents in multiple languages is a key issue. And uh, HUD has taken on the entire state of New Jersey. It was one of, one of, one of my more interesting moments. Um, the, in the post-Sandy, Superstorm Sandy disaster recovery activities in the state of New Jersey, the area that was hardest hit had a lot of language minorities uh, living in them, and um, we found that the post-Sandy recovery activities by the state of New Jersey didn't fail to meet the needs of those language minorities. And um, we did an investigation. Uh, my secretary of HUD had a conversation with Governor Christie. about where the next tranche of funding was going to be coming from. And, um, and so we resolved the matter with the state of New Jersey in a much bigger settlement that addresses limited English proficiency, access, language interpretation, the availability of translation of vital documents for people to uh, apply for disaster recovery money. And, um, and also uh, resulted in an agreement that there would be the, exp the um, expenditure of $240 million. $240 million for affordable housing in, in communities that had the, 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 the housing destroyed or seriously damaged by the storm. The point here being that in the areas impacted by Sandy, the affordable housing was actually in whiter neighborhoods. And more, at least middle class neighborhoods. And so, just rebuilding that housing and restoring it on site would have countered um, patterns of segregation. To have moved it to other places, that housing would have potentially perpetuated segregation. And many of those communities said, no, 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 we don't want to put this housing right back here. We want to put it right down this road over here because we want to put a casino in here or whatever they were talking about, right? And the answer was no because that would have taken the affordable housing and put it out of commuting distance, far, far away from anything interesting or helpful to people actually living real lives, and, um, and where, they, where the housing was previously located was the right location. So a few things about strategies. Now we come back to what you're going to do about this. You're listening carefully, correct? So starting by item one, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Some of you do with, deal with this all the day, all, every day. I know that. I can see it in your eyes, in your posture, and in your reactions to what I'm saying. But many of you don't think about this every day. Think about, um, look again at your communities and look for patterns. Look for patterns. Uh, so here's things to look for. Think about a neighborhood that's segregated by race uh, or national origin. Think about where the affordable housing is located and tell me, does, is there investment there? Are there groceries? Are there drug stores? Are there bank, branch banks? Are there transportation? Are there good schools? If not, that's a neighborhood you might consider spending some time and energy on. Um, look for um, the, 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 where your ba banking services are located, where your branch banks are located if you're a lender or interested in having access to lending opportunities. One of the powerful things that we see making change in many uh, communities of color right now is a combination of affordable and market rate housing with um, both mixed income and mixed use associated with it. So it brings the Safeway or the Kroger or, or the CVS or the Walgreens or the Walmart or whatever it is, the Target, into the community. And you know, we see this in high-end communities too, and so it's just flipping it. In a high-end community in D.C. area where I live, you see all kinds of suburban places where they have the Panera, I'm not mentioning these places by accident. The Starbucks, they used to have Borders books, but now the Borders books are gone. They have something else. Maybe it's an H&M clothing store or something. And then over them, or next to them, they have rental housing, right? And it's all this cool new mixed-use development, right? That's a, that's a model. So we should be putting some of those into the racially segregated and poor neighborhoods 
do. And those properties that are getting built out in the higher opportunity areas should have some affordable units. And I mean affordable for poor people, incomes of $30,000 or less. I'm just saying. And it would be nice if we added to that, could you do something besides one or two bedroom development and do some three, four, and five bedroom developments? Because actually poor people have families, you know? Okay? And yeah, don't forget to add a little bit of accessibility in there too. Right? The Fair Housing Act requires all new construction to be des designed and constructed to be usable by people with disabilities. If there's HUD money, there's a requirement that at least 5% of the units plus an additional 2% of the units have to be accessible to people with physical disabilities, young and old, and also to people with sensory impairments. And HUD is working on strategies that will increase, require, encourage, the increase in the number of accessible units because guess what? Our population is aging and we're getting more riggedy. I personally attribute this to the fact that we've all been jogging for so long. <laughs> Our knees are really bad, y'all. And we're not going to want to do steps. Not even a little one. And you know what I'm talking about. Don't, don't look at me like that. You know exactly what you're talking about. If I have to climb the flight of steps in my house one more time, I'm going to have a giant headache. You know? So we want to, you know, we want... <laughs> market rate accessibility across the community and, ex and ex more accessible housing for low and very low income populations. When you look at census data, the people who have, uh, or a American Community Survey data or whatever it is you're looking at, the number of people, the percentage of people in the uh, low income community who have trouble walking long distances without assistance, who have difficulty climbing steps is like climbing, 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 and it's not much lower in the general population, because of that jogging thing. So um, paying attention to accessibility, a range of choices in the community, and community-based options for people with disabilities as part of your plan. So pick a neighborhood. Could be a high opportunity neighborhood, could be a poor, low-income neighborhood. Find a group. It could be this group. It could be Marin County Fair Housing. It could be a faith-based group. It could be an interest group. It could be a friend group. It could be uh, your business. And start thinking about how you can support investment to support more affordable housing and more opportunity wherever the neighborhood is that you pick. So first you pick the neighborhood and you think about what's missing. Is, it's, is it affordable housing that's missing? Everything else is there? Or is it, we got plenty of affordable housing there, it's just everything else is missing. Pick a neighborhood. Find a group. Maybe it's a church based in that, or in that community. Maybe it is something that your community gets together. Maybe it's an area that you get together and talk about with your council member. Start focusing on that. Do some research. Uh, make a plan. Make a plan. Find some friends in the affordable housing development community. People who work very hard and are often very committed to the development of affordable housing. Find some people in the supportive housing network. Some, find some friends in the shelter no network as well. Because the truth is we need these range of choices across our community. Make a plan. Broaden your crowd. Take it to your planning officials. Change the world. It's a new application of the, you know, think, uh, think globally, act locally mantra. But I've seen it happen in community after community. A community group starts talking, or a fair housing group, or government officials start talking to a, to a community planning group, the housing and community development group, the group that gets big funding from HUD, and they, they to collaborate to find a neighborhood to work on. And sometimes it's two kinds of neighborhoods. It's one where everything is there except affordable housing, and it's another one over here where, you know, there is all of the affordable housing, but nothing else. I give you two big sort of focuses, and then I know I have to stop. If you've got a plan for the development of a new affordable housing that also correlates to the absence, to changing and moving people uh, who, for example, live in dilapidated housing or housing that is not accessible or whatever, and, and you're going to, you know that you're going to take some property and demolish it and you're going to build something new, for heaven's sake, build the new stuff first, y'all. I cannot tell you how this is so simple and that nobody ever does it. You build the new stuff first and you get everybody to move in. And then you don't have to which is exactly opposite for where it mostly happens. How it mostly happens is, oh, this place is a pile of crap. Look, I made it all the way into my speech until almost the end before I used a bad word. <laughs> and they're going to tear it down. 
And so what you do is we, all these plans, we're going to take it down because everybody in the neighborhood is all happy because it's just a terrible piece of junk. But then what you do when you tear it down is you give people Uniform Relocation Act benefits if you're required to and a voucher and you wave bye-bye and then they're gone because there's not an, they're gone and nobody can find them again and they're struggling. I have friends who left Washington, D.C. with a voucher and had to go all the way to Aberdeen, Maryland, a hundred miles away to find an affordable unit. Well, I'm going to call a friend of mine because that's what she had to do because there were no landlords taking vouchers anywhere and that assumes you have a voucher. Instead, build the new construction first, build a couple of new things first, but house them from the places where their things are old and dilapidated. Encourage people to move as friend groups or family groups. Nobody ever thinks about this. But you know, one of the hard things to move to an area of opportunity is that if you're a single mom with a couple of kids, you do not want to leave your church, your family, and your car that you borrow from your best friend's girlfriend's boyfriend, or whatever, you know, to move out there. You might want, your, want it for your kids, but the mechanics of it are very much a challenge. Let friend groups move, to move together. Developers, find friend groups, family groups. So auntie and grandma and a couple of sisters and maybe best friend over here, you know, they all move kind of together so that then they can share child care, getting back and forth to church, uh, job transportation, going to the grocery store. Uh, so, then, and then, so build first is a big mantra for me. Build the replacement housing first and let people move directly there. Don't send them off onto vouchers. There's always going to be enough people to live in affordable housing. It's just set the priorities correctly. And I guess the, the final thing I'll say, because I can feel people looking over my shoulder. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got questions to answer too. Well, correct. Okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um, this is, not, this is not a job for any one of us. Whether you work for HUD or city planning office or you're a developer, no one of us can make this, this kind of change happen. But together, we can make this kind of change happen. The developer's information should inform the planners. The community's information and ideas should inform both of them. And so it's like making a plan that involves people actually talking about stuff. You know, my um, husband who died a long, a long time ago was a city planner and he said, you know, make no small plans. Make a real plan. And then t with or without the assistance of your community planning folks, and then take it in and have people there. Find a business to help you. Find a banker who wants to do some CRA positive stuff. Find a banker that's been sued for discrimination. Bring them onto your team. <laughs> so, Here's the thing, it's going to take all of us uh, to, as they say, tap the vault of opportunity for our communities. It's not any one of us, it's not any one friend group or interest group, it's all of us. It's going to take all of us to cash the check of justice. Our communities, y'all, are only as strong as their weakest link. When you think about your community, you know what the weak links are. You don't need me from HUD to tell you, you know what they are. If you really think about it and you open your eyes, you look and you listen, you know what they are. It is now, for you guys in the Bay Area, the time to echo Dr. King to make real the promises of democracy. I have confidence that you can do it. And I am not going to let you outside the doors of this room without an assurance that you will take on these projects in, the, in, in your communities, will you? We're going to talk later. All right. I thank you all for your attention and for your commitment. Do what you want. Got the question? Thank you. They told me I couldn't go to the bathroom until I answered these questions. I just want to say we're, we are well into our break time, but we're going to just take one or two questions. And again, if you're, you have a question or part of a question, ooh, more questions, then I'm going to suggest that, um, that you tackle Sarah, who will be around. She's not leaving immediately. I'm going to be here all day because she sucked me into doing another panel this afternoon and because I'm going to see the dialogue between Jeff Jackson and Lisa Rice late this afternoon. Can and, hardly and, wait. And she came with a van full of people and they're not going to... You know. They're not going to let me leave. Yeah. So. <laughs> just a couple, just like a couple okay, we have done what you said to do in the last two years. Congratulations. 
glad to know all the problems are taken care of. No, wait. So, Sonoma County needs to build 3,000 new affordable housing units. We need major federal funding to do this. How do we get it? All right. Housing element. Talk to Jeff Jackson, who understands this much better than I ever will. Tax credits. Home funds through available through the state CDBG program can be used for part of the funding. The new A11 program can fund up to 25% of the units for um, housing for people with disabilities, right? Um, local funding, including community development block grant funding, are possible. If there are any public housing units uh, that need to be demolished, sometimes the public housing agency will be able to contribute some funds. The combination of funds that I like to see is Actually, most of the time is tax credit built or, or funded with the start with some additional funds built in. And in today's world, you have to have the other funds. You know, how many of you have private developers, uh, including Wall Street, who will truly invest in affordable housing? Raise your hand. I want to talk to you. Okay? There are some developers and, you know, and some investors who will do this. But again, used to, Fannie and Freddie did a lot of investment in this area, and they're not. So 3,000 units is a lot of units in Sonoma County. Have you figured out where they should go physically? If you have, then you should part start partnering with developers and with your local planning department to target the areas where you want to start that will be consistent with whatever the priorities are that are established by uh, the state in uh, administering its tax credit program. That's my idea for first steps. Is that close enough? And look, for, look to the state for home funding and other f opportunities to augment that, uh, ta those tax credit units and help support all right, let's see. Has HUD considered the following as a failure to affirmatively further fair housing? A city fails to adopt policies that prevent displacement of low-income people of color in the face of gentrification caused by development that increases demand in the neighborhood and causes large increases in rent, evictions, harassment, especially where the city has some role in facilitating development. So, summary phrase, displacement causes resegregation. Uh, inclusion of gentrification in the community uh, creates a problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved in that fight right now in D.C. The, the problem is using gentrification in a positive way to help support a stronger neighborhood while still providing hard units, hard units, not Section 8, either part in the neighborhood and part someplace else. And then I think the, the thing that gets missing in this is mobility programs. So. So you can't just, let's get rid of all the poor people and replace, them with, replace the housing with, with low-end people. Yes, I say, if there is a race or national origin connection to what these actions are, it's a failure to affirmatively further fair housing, no question. But the, but the other question is, it's just a planning thing. It's not, that, it's not rocket science, y'all. If, if you say there's, too much, there's affordable housing here and it's a segregated area and we're going to bring in all these high-end stuff to you know, make things more diverse, the part that you're missing is you can't just destroy the affordable housing, run the people out of town, or invite them to move to Riverside County. Eyes rolling. So, therefore, you have to rebuild some units back into the community so people do actually get improved housing, add in some gentrification and some of that mixed use stuff, and provide some hard units elsewhere. And yes, that's hard to do because nobody's given anybody any money to do that, but that is still the right way to do it. And I see it happening in some communities, especially through use of inclusionary zoning ordinances. Footnotes, let's talk to Tim Iglesias this afternoon. Okay. So I didn't answer all your questions, but I will be around at the break, and I will be around at lunch, and I will be around this afternoon, so you can ask me as many questions as you want before I get out of town. Thank you so very much.